structures and intensive agriculture and urbanization. On the other hand, about a third of the streams that we assessed had lower than natural base flows. And these occurred throughout the country, but were especially prominent out west, where we have a lot of uh, groundwater pumping and a lot of diversions for a variety of purposes. Now, in addition to base flow, which I just showed you, um, we found that high flows in streams were less than natural at about half the streams that we assessed. And the variability of stream flow was less than natural at about 40% of the streams we assessed. And what we mean by this is basically we've taken the natural ebbs and flows and pretty much made the flows <laughs> constant. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of phenomenon we often observe here. Well, what, is this, what does this matter to the biological communities? Well, I'd like to show you how that actually looks. Um, in a stream that has relatively natural flows that's, that's not uh, disturbed too much by human activities, if we look at the biological communities, what we see are many, many native species, many of which rely on cooler, cold water temperatures. Uh, many macroinvertebrate species <coughs> have very specific requirements for high oxygen in, in the water. And many fish species um, reproduce in a very narrow, a very specific season of the year. And oftentimes that reproductive period is synchronized with the natural flows. So they know when these flows are changing for their own benefit. Now, they'll lay their eggs in shallow gravel in the bottom of the stream. And for those eggs to survive, they need a relatively constant and predictable flow of water over them. So that's sort of what a natural system might look like. Now in a system where we have modified flows, and in this example, uh, lower than natural flows, or depleted flows, uh, one of the big things we notice is a, a, a major loss of native species. And those native species are often replaced by non-native species, or sometimes even invasive species, which have all kinds of other problems associated with them. And few of the species, or the species that survive also often thrive in warm water temperatures, um, uh, and also with low dissolved oxygen. They can get by without a lot of oxygen in the water. Interestingly, a lot of the fish that thrive in these systems reproduce any time of the year, and they do so by scattering their eggs just throughout the stream in hopes that some of them find a good place to live. It's really the life strategy of a dandelion, for lack of a better word. And then interestingly, the Algae communities don't always have a consistent response to flow modification. And one reason might be because their life cycles are more tightly synchronized with the chemistry of the water than they are with the flow, with the quantity of the water. Well, this little, this little example shows, a, a, I think, illustrates a couple of important points. One of them is uh, that these biological communities respond differently to this human caused uh, stressors, this flow modification. And the second thing we've learned from this is that streams that have modified flows are also especially vulnerable to additional human stressors that might change the water or air temperature, which we might expect under various scenarios of climate change. So that's the story on flow. Uh, I'd like to now talk about excess nutrients. Now, nutrients are applied as fertilizers to our lawns and crops and gardens, and some of which uh, enter our waterways. Um, as Bill mentioned, NOCLA did a national assessment of stream flow, I'm sorry, a national assessment of nutrients in streams and rivers. Um, and the main point from that report was that in agricultural and in urban settings, nutrient levels were many, many times higher than background levels. And background levels would be the nutrients we would expect in the absence of fertilizer applications to the landscape. So in this report, what we've done now is taken that information and linked it with the biological communities. And what we find is that algae communities are, are, are extremely uh, highly associated with nutrients in the stream. And in fact, what we see is that the occurrence of algae communities in poor condition, so remember, these are communities that have less than their natural potential or that are impacted. Uh, the occurrence of these communities increased nearly 40% as nutrient levels increased. This is a, a very broad analysis across all the different land uses and across the country as a whole. Now, algae grow by absorbing these nutrients directly out of the water column. So these organisms are very sensitive to changes in the chemistry of their environment, and they're therefore very good early warning indicators 
of the ecological consequences of excess nutrients in our waterways. Moving on to pesticides. Um, these compounds are also applied to our lawns and crops and gardens, some of which enter into our waterways. Uh, several years ago, NACWA did a national assessment of pesticides in streams and groundwater. The main finding from that report was that uh, pesticides were detected in nearly every stream that we assessed that was in agricultural or urban watersheds. Nearly every stream. And even though those concentrations varied through time, like I showed you on, on the Des Moines River, um, many times those concentrations reach levels that are potentially harmful to aquatic life. So that was the finding from the previous report. And now what we've done is, again, bring it in with the biological data. And what we find is the macroinvertebrate communities are uh, highly associated with pesticide levels. Specifically, the occurrence of communities in poor condition uh, increased over 40% as pesticide levels increased. And again, this is across different land uses and across the country as a whole. <clears throat> now, the most potentially toxic pesticides that we found were insecticides, which of course are designed to kill insects. Well, macroinvertebrate communities and streams are, are uh, pretty much dominated by aquatic versions of insects. So, this community is especially sensitive to insecticides that get into our waterways. Now, in recent years, the EPA has uh, stepped up some of the regulation of some of these insecticides that we observed, um, and especially in urban areas. And NACWA uh, monitoring has, uh, did confirm that those concentrations of pesticides declined in the environment after the EPA uh, took those actions. Now, importantly, uh, when these uh, pesticides were taken off the market, they are re were replaced by other compounds, other pesticides uh, that have different chemical properties. So it will be important for us to continue to monitor how those compounds and chemicals behave in the environment and potentially affect uh, ecosystems. So <clears throat> I just told you about three uh, important factors that influence stream health across the country. A modification of natural flows, excess nutrients and pesticides, I want to emphasize that this does not mean that these factors are equally important everywhere, nor are these the only factors that impair stream health across the country. In fact, in any given stream, it's very likely that many factors are at play in, 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 in harming the stream health. And to get this point across, I want to tell you a story about a stream, uh, Shingle Creek, a watershed, it's in an urban watershed in Minnesota. Well, Shingle Creek, uh, Samples of the biological communities by NACWA and our partners all reveal that the aquatic communities were all in poor condition. In other words, all of these communities <coughs> were less than their potential. Well, at this point, we, uh, uh, resource managers and scientists really have to become like detectives and figure out, okay, what, you know, where can we get information that provides evidence for or against alternative causes of this poor health? Well, a good place to look for clues is the biological communities themselves, because these critters are living in the water for weeks to years. And so they can really tell us a lot about the kinds of conditions they've been exposed to. So what do the communities in Shingle Creek tell us about what might be causing poor health in the stream? If we look at the algae communities, what we find is that, uh, the most abundant species are the ones who really like highly saline environments. Okay, well this is a freshwater stream, right? So uh, the implication there is that we have, may have a salinity problem. And in fact, when we look at the intensive monitoring data that took place with NACWA and, and our partners, what we found is very high levels of salinity in Shingle Creek during the winter. And this led to the conclusion that road salts applied to de-ice the, stre the, the streets and sidewalks and such were washing into the streams and groundwater. Well, it's tempting to stop here and say, aha, we've figured out what the problem is. Let's roll up our sleeves and see what we can do to fix it. Well, it's very important in this, in this process of diagnosing the causes of, of poor stream health that we examine all parts of the ecosystem. We can't ignore other biological communities. And so if we look at macroinvertebrates, what do they tell us about poor health in Shingle Creek? Well, what we see in... in uh, in the macroinvertebrate communities, there's a lot of species that uh, have 
evolved in different ways to breathe outside of water. In other words, they don't need a whole lot of oxygen in the water to get by. So that tells us, well, we might have a problem with dissolved oxygen in the stream. And in fact, when we look at the intensive chemical monitoring that occurred in Shingle Creek, what we see is during the summer, many times, that dissolved oxygen dips below levels that are known to be harmful to aquatic life. Well, what do the fish tell us about what's wrong with Shingle Creek? Here is what we don't see that's striking. What we don't see in, in this community uh, is several species that have very specific habitat requirements. We know they should be there because we've looked at streams that are undisturbed in that area, and we know that these species ought to be in Shingle Creek, but they're not. Well, that suggests we may have a problem with, with habitat quality. Now, there is a, a USGS stream gauging station in Shingle Creek and that's been measuring stream flow. Um, every 15 minutes, uh, automated. There's not a person out there dipping water every 15 minutes. Measuring flow for over 10 years. And if we look at those data, what we see um, is there's been changes in the flow that are probably the cause of this habitat degradation. What we've seen is the stream flows become much more, um, much more fluctuating or flashy, which is pretty common in urban streams because the rainwater rushes off the, the roads and the pavement and into the stream channels, and those big pulses of water can cause erosion to the stream banks and the stream bottom, which, which harms the habitat. So to recap, the algae community, in, in harmony with the intensive monitoring data, revealed that we have a problem with salinity in the winter. The macroinvertebrate community, again, used with the intensive chemical monitoring data, revealed that we have a dissolved oxygen problem in the summer. And the fish community, along with the stream flow monitoring information, revealed that we have a problem with habitat that has occurred and is probably continuing to occur over the last several years. Now, this story in Sh Shingle Creek is not unique. We see this in agricultural and urban streams across the country. But it teaches us a very important lesson. And that is, um, if we're going to understand what is causing poor stream health, we really need to uh, assess multiple biological communities, not just one, but many. Um, and we need to measure the chemical and the physical parts of the ecosystem that can cause those communities harm at different times of year and at different time scales. So um, I'd like to close with just the, the take home messages I hope you guys remember. Um, the first is, um, in our attempts to understand stream health and to understand what harms stream health, it's vitally important that we uh, assess multiple biological communities because each community has its own vulnerabilities, unique vulnerabilities, to human-caused stressors. And I think I've shown you that throughout the talk today. Also, these communities have uh, different and vital parts of the ecosystem. You know, they're, they're, they have vital roles in the ecosystem itself. What that means is that when we do assessments, and when we limit those assessments to a single biological community, um, those assessments are important and they give us good information, but they're probably overlooking some factors that are causing poor health and probably underestimating the scope of the problem. Point number two, uh, again, a quick review. The stream flows, natural stream flows in the country streams are widely modified and are um, an important reason why a lot of streams have impaired health. Stream flow is such an overarching and important part of streams, however, that remediation of chemical pollutants like, like nutrients and pesticides may not get us all the way where we want to healthy streams if we don't also consider that these streams need some semblance of natural patterns of flow as well. Truly, water quality and water quantity are inexorably linked. And finally, in any given stream, with its in poor stream health, there, it's very rare that we can point our finger at one thing. There's often many factors at play, and to understand those factors, we have to monitor them at the scales that matter to the biology, to the ecosystem. So we have to monitor these factors at the times of the year when they are important to the communities. Um, so the uh, the report from which this talk was given are in the, in the package you received. Um, on this website, you can find 
uh, the data that went into this report. You can find, we're working on a really cool podcast. It'll be up in a couple of days. Um, and you can find also links to other reports that the NACA program um, has, has put out in the last couple of years. So with that, I will stop. And thank you for your attention. Our second speaker today is uh, Mr. David McKinney. Uh, David is the uh, Chief of Environmental Services and Habitat Protection for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Uh, he's a former manager of the East Tennessee Office of the Division of Water Pollution Control for the Tennessee Department of Environment uh, and Conservation. Um, he holds a, a Master of Science in Aquatic Ecology from the University of Tennessee and a law degree from the Nashville School of Law. So with that, I'd like to introduce him. Thank you and, and good morning. Uh, we are here today to discuss how to bring good science to protection of the nation's aquatic resources. I'd like to tell you a little bit about why that is important to the state of Tennessee. Uh, we have some 60,000 miles of streams and rivers spread across the state. It's a network that provides for commercial navigation, for recreational activities, it provides water for agriculture and industry. We have a world-class sport fishery and importantly provides water, drinking water, and public water supply from one end of the state to the other. We withdraw something in the neighborhood of 10 billion gallons of water a day to support all of these uses. Um, but what makes Tennessee's aquatic ecological resources unique is that this 60,000 miles of streams and rivers are spread over such distinctly different ecological and physiographic regions. Starting in the east, you have the forested uh, Appalachian Mountains, which rise to, to 6,000 feet. You come across the Tennessee Ridge and Valley System, where the headwaters of the Tennessee River are gathered. Up over the Cumberland Plateau, which the Nature Conservancy refers to as a biodiversity hotspot for North American, and then down across the uh, interior low plateau or highland rim that surrounds the central basin. As you go up over the western highland rim, you come out into the alluvial plain of the Mississippi and coastal and coastal plains. Um, this this diversity of habitats and the diversity of streams and, and water sources has led what David Attenire, Professor Emeritus of Fisheries at the University of Tennessee refers to as a theater of uh, evolution for fish and aquatic life unlike any other. The challenges we face in Tennessee are similar to what other states are facing. They come from population growth land use change that is attendant to them and increasing pressure on water supplies, all with a backdrop of, of changing, uh, changing climate. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that all states are dealing with has to do with the influence and the hydrologic behavior of streams from water withdrawal. In 06, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in conjunction with other state and federal agencies and conservation organizations, began a project where they looked at the fish community records from over a thousand sites in Tennessee. Many of these sites had records that go back multiple years. This information was integrated with hydrologic behavior information, both historic and present, from over 300 sites. The results of this study confirm what the GS is finding nationwide, that as you change the natural hydrologic behavior of streams, you can in adversely in impact uh, the fish community and set up a situation where compounding factors like nutrients can have an additional adverse effect. In Tennessee, our normal low flow period is in the fall of the year, but if withdrawal of water stretches that low flow period well into the early summer and well into late fall, then the fish community, the aquatic community of insects are faced with the cumulative impact of reduced habitat, uh, 
higher water temperatures, lower dissolved oxygen, and the complicating impacts of things like, like nutrients. So how do we take this information and apply it to the decision-making process at the state level? In Tennessee recently completed um, two model regional water supply plans in conjunction with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Geological Survey, and some conservation organizations. Um, keep in mind that the communities affected in these two model plans, one for the north central part of the state, the other for the southern part of the Cumberland Plateau, these communities are located where they are because of reliable water supply. Many of them date back to the late 1700s, early 1800s. In the intervening years, these aquatic resources can no longer support the community. So the problems are twofold. One is the community no longer has a safe, reliable water supply. The other is, as you take more and more water out of the stream, it affects the ecological health of the stream. These two plans seek to tie together these communities through infrastructure that will allow them in times of low flow and even drought to withdraw from larger sources like the Tennessee River, the Cumberland River, or existing larger reservoirs. This brings us an opportunity to apply another tool that was developed by the USGS and the MACWA program, and that is that cluster of models that are referred to as SPARROW particularly those that allow us to project the influence of nutrients on streams. As streams slow down in mean, impounded situations, they heat up and are exposed to more sunlight, and nutrients can cause algal blooms which result in taste and odor problems for uh, public water supply, can also result in toxicity problems for fish and aquatic life and on very rare occasions can result in problems with the public health. I want to close with some remark remarks about the biological diversity that, that is found in Tennessee. For freshwater ecological systems, it is the most biologically diverse stream system in North America. We have over 325 species of fish many of which are as colorful as anything you'll find in the tropics, and over 400 species of freshwater mussels. Keep in mind that these two are linked. The mussel requires a fish in its life cycle, and not just any fish, a specific species of fish. If that species disappears from the system, then in short order, the mussel fauna of that particular mussel group will also disappear. The state's name comes from a Native American word, Tenasqui, which the Spanish encountered in the 1500s and interpreted to mean something like river country. But more importantly, it embraced the benefits of living in river country. We have no illusion about how difficult it's going to be in the coming years to protect this diversity of aquatic resources. But good science, cooperative partnerships with our neighboring states, good partnership, collaborative projects with the federal agencies, conservation groups, and our citizens are our best chance of success. Um, thank, I want to thank the sponsors of this event, and particularly my colleagues that helped put all of this together. We'll be around to answer any questions you may have later. Thank you. Our final speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Peter Ode. Um, Peter is the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Water Pollution or Water, Quality, Water Control Laboratory. Um, he received his PhD in entomology from Cornell <coughs> University with a, with a specialization in stream um, insect ecology. Since 2005, uh, Peter has served as the lead scientist for the State Water Resources Control Board Bioassessment Program and he currently co-leads the state's technical team charged with uh, developing the technical foundation for California's statewide 
biological water quality standards. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dr. Rohde. Thank you, Ben. Well, good morning, everybody, and greetings from sunny California. I have to say that I thought um, Central Valley was hot, but you guys have a speed. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak in support of this really valuable work. I, my goal today is to give you a little sense of what the, these federal water resource programs mean in states like California. Um, let me see here. The, if you think about water resource monitoring in the country, much of the, much of the work that's done derives from authorities and mandates in the Clean Water Act. California has its own version of this uh, called the Porter Cologne Act, which was actually enacted a few years before the Clean Water Act and, and, and in fact served as a model for much of the language in the Clean Water Act. Um, both of these forms of legislation had a tremendous, uh, were tremendous successes in the uh, early years in dealing with point source pollution especially. And a lot of the initial problems have, were, were cleaned up. But as we've gone along in time, we've realized that much more difficult non-point sources have stymied progress in um, water resource management for decades now. Despite hundreds of billions of dollars 